Welcome to the College of Architecture and Planning Monday Night Lecture Series. We're delighted to welcome you here tonight. Tonight's lecture is uh, a lecture more or less under the auspices of the Department of Urban and Regional Planning, and we're delighted tonight to bring you something a little bit different, perhaps, from the ordinary, uh, the usual set of lectures. Um, our lecturer tonight is an extraordinary person. She is a person who embodies the notion that cities are for people. That when we deal with cities, we don't deal solely with buildings, but we deal with a much more complex set of variables, social, economic, and ultimately people variables. And uh, as Henry Churchill, that wonderful architect planner, said years ago, cities are for people. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Louise Taylor. Dr. Taylor is currently the Deputy Director of Research for the Joint Center of the Joint Center for Political Studies of Washington, D.C. The Joint Center is the, the center which uh, is concerned with and focuses the attention of the political life of this nation uh, for elected, black elected officials and thereby plays a very important role in the workings of the national structure in Washington and uh, uh, we're delighted to have Louise here tonight to speak to some of the special problems which we're all concerned with in cities, which are concerned with the, the neighborhoods, central city problems, problems of lower income and minority groups, problems of people. Dr. Taylor is an adjunct faculty member of George Washington University and also Johns Hopkins University. She is a member of the advisory board of the Program for Administration at Ryder College. She has been uh, a faculty member at the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs at Syracuse University. She has lectured and instructed people around the world, including participation in the mid-career training program sponsored by the federal government in Africa and the Philippines. She has, uh, previous to her appointment at the Joint Center, been a social science analyst in the Division of Special Studies, Policy Development and Program Evaluation in the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Dr. Taylor has a B.S. in Educational Sociology from New York University, an M.S. in Education from Jersey State University, and her doctorate is in Public and International Affairs from the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs of the University of Pittsburgh. And she has written many papers and is a member of many professional societies. I won't list them all here. It's with great pleasure that I present to you Dr. Louise Taylor. of the faculty and the students for inviting me to be with you tonight. It was about a year ago that David and Malcolm and I talked about the possibility of my being with you on April 30th. And at that time, oh, I guess it was just about a month before the release of the president's urban policy, and it occurred to us that this would be a particularly uh, a good topic for us to pursue tonight in talking about national policies and local planning dilemmas. Now it's uh, 
a year, I guess it was um, May 27th, when the formal release of the policy took place. And it appears that the possibility of having a comprehensive urban policy and the concept of targeting people and places are in jeopardy, if not indeed dead. No action is going forward on the National Development Bank, which was the largest part of the urban policy. The Labor Intensive Policy Works Program was accepted by only one house, and the Anti-Recession Fiscal Assistance Program has expired. You may recall that some of the conclusions and proposals in the administration's package met with such hostility that one official observed that President Carter will probably be the last president that will ever offer an initiative called an urban policy. Because of this and despite this, I am convinced that the dilemma of local planning in addressing such national policies remains apparent. Obviously, it is evident simply in the confusion which emerges when planning is predicated on a set of expectations about federal roles and federal programs which never come to fruition. It is evidenced when reality prevails and the local planner has to come to grips with, while others may bring certain type policy initiatives to a halt on an ongoing basis, he or she is forced to enunciate plans and policies. The dilemmas are equally evident when the local planner is courageous enough to face the query, would any of the policies have made a difference. So a long set of expected comprehensive policies are pronounced and then are dissipated for a variety of reasons. The fallout in hostility and political retributions create a policy-shy atmosphere and cynics are able to engulf another segment of planners who in frustration capitulate saying, I guess different policies would not have made things any better anyway. The latter posture is understandable in light of conventional wisdom. For example, there were four major thrusts that were enunciated in the comprehensive urban policy that was proposed. There was to be coordinating and a strengthening of relationships among federal, state, and local governments. There was also supposed to be fiscal assistance. The third thrust was employment and economic development. And the fourth, community and human development. The potential stress points are seen in each one of these, and I'm simply going to identify some of them that I think it's important for the local planner to think about. Regarding relationships among various levels of government, there was an immediate response and reaction about the role of states. While some politicians and planners maintain that states have both the money and the power to bring about stability and vitality to cities, others argue that the states shared the blame for the deterioration of cities. And they went on to question why policies should be enacted to give financial aid to states to pass along to cure problems that they, in fact, had helped to create. A part of the dialogue has also been assumed by neighborhoods in which local advocates challenged any coordination effort and any financial assistance in which a significant role is not given to the local neighborhood organizations. 
The planner, therefore, is left with one of the dilemmas that I think we need to address. Who, therefore, is the client? Who is the sanctioning agent? Who takes part in the decision making? What can the decision making process be? And then, who defines the goals? The potential problems of collaboration among units of government are even more confounding in light of the experiences with metro government and COGS. And when studies such as those carried on by ACIR and indeed the Joint Center get a response from many leaders, political leaders, and planners and practitioners of, in other fields who say that coordination is in response to the federal government's demands and most often is played out on paper and not in practice. In terms of fiscal assistance, the second proposal thrust of the comprehensive policy, the problems of fiscal austerity are manifested. The primary objective of the proposed national budget is to reduce inflation. While there is support for prudent spending and sound management practices, many citizens still look to the planners and to the local elected officials for maintenance of effort and for improvement in the quality of services. This is particularly manifested in what resulted from the polls in Proposition 13. At first look at the polls, it becomes very obvious that people are talking about fiscal austerity, about more sound management practices, but then in closer scrutiny and in trade-off questions, the dilemma that planners and political officials face is a set of uh, demands from the public where they're saying, we want more with less, and we want any kind of fiscal constraints not to affect the kinds of things in which I believe. Moreover, when we talk in terms of the fiscal assistance that was to come in terms of the urban policy, the planner is faced with the dilemma of deciding how to function with a limited budget. Do we spread the funds around? Do we concentrate the funds? If we concentrate the funds, who makes the decision about to whom the money should go? How do we respond to political clout? Do we need to respond to our own needs assessment? Or is this put aside? And then the question that is asked in light of all of this, how do you analyze and how do you evaluate impact? I recall very vividly uh, in working with community block grants in the city of Syracuse, with enthusiasm engaging in allocation of funds and talking with citizens about what should happen. And it was early into the program that I began to caution about, let's not expect too much, and then ended up saying, well, we really can't have any impact. And a graphic illustration of this is within the urban policy, although it hasn't come to fruition, but the trade-offs in terms of fiscal assistance was $50 million, which was to go for health planning. Okay, so you have a million dollars for each state. How do you allocate a million dollars to have an impact in health programs? This, this is just another example of the dilemma the plan of face. And then the third thrust is in economic development. And that can be as equally perplexing. The planners very often ask the question, are there some cities or areas of cities that no longer can be economically viable if not robust? What data are used to make this determination? 
if triage is to be practiced, who should make the decision? What should be done with the inhabitants of areas which are deemed economically dead and unable to sustain a, po a population? If a partnership is to be nurtured with industry, how does the local planner identify what, in fact, will attract, support, and sustain economic development? Throughout the urban policy, the concept of a partnership with private industry is set forth. And there is a litany of unanswered questions that is posed, uh, that are posed to us, uh, those of us who are willing to admit that there are dilemmas. Why did industry leave some of our cities? Did the tax codes cause it? Is it the configurations of the site so that more space is needed and in, indeed, different configurations? Fortune magazine at one time set forth the notion that what was really happening was that industry was following the residence of those executives, and that was completely ignored. How about crime? And this was not discussed in the urban policy, but when we look at a variety of other uh, policy analyses, it says that crime or the perception of crime has caused the flight of industry. People such as those who serve with um, agencies to attract industry also maintain that cultural activities, fire, police services, are the things that are required. And then there's the other thing, the quality of schools. But beyond this, the notion is also set forth that executives and the top people within their industry not only are seeking quality schools, but at a certain time in the uh, school life of their children, they leave for fear of daughters particularly being associated with people of other ethnic or racial groups. How does industry respond to that if indeed it is something that has to be faced? And then when you superimpose all of this uh, mosaic in terms of the partnership that is set forth and our admission that all of these things possibly, or at least from the perspective of some people, have caused the flight of industry how then does the planner respond? What is the sufficient and necessary variable at which we would look in order to attract industry? But this is difficult enough without adding to it the fact that while people uh, may say the quality of schools will be very important, 98% of the school bonds are defeated in the country. And then with the uh, concerns about uh, taxpayers getting enough for their money, the return to competency, the accountability for teachers. How do we improve the schools when uh, there's no money? And the same people who are uh, asking for improved schools in order to attract industry now say, but we don't have the money to do this. And then the overlay on all of these things in terms of the partnership for economic development is the question of what role will the government assume in its variety of national programs and activities not to exacerbate the conditions or to lend credence to the conditions that do cause the flight from the cities. And then the other thing that is talked about considerably is how can we ask industry which is spending extensive amounts in becoming um, involved in cost-saving technology now to consider labor-intensive technology. Those things appear to be uh, lacking in congruence, but yet these are the kinds of policies that we have to face. Quickly moving on to housing and community development. When the government offers, as it does in the national uh, policy that was proposed, 312 loans for housing rehabilitation, 
It also presented a caveat that said, and I'm paraphrasing, of course, now we know there's the possibility that these rehabilitation loans may create displacement for some people. And what we want you to do when you engage in uh, a policy with these 312 loans is to keep this in mind, you know, simply stated. Should a conscious effort be used to provide housing for revenue generating populations in cities that are deteriorating? Or should the money be used for lower income existing populations? What should be or can there be a balance in allocation to maintain the physical structure while providing social services? And will immediate attention to the physical plant result in long-term benefits for the people? Is there a trickle up or a trickle down? Do we know? Well, these confused and often complex questions are seldom posed in a climate which allows the local planner the luxury of deciding that potential community conflict or political reprisals caution that no action is best. The lack of a comprehensive national pro uh, policy does not mean that the dilemmas will be lessened. I don't find it very comforting, but it does give me hope that a committee of the National Research Council convened a meeting to discuss problems similar to this. And there were people, names of which you know, such as uh, Bernie Frieden, Wilfred Owens, Melvin Weber, and Norman Kromholtz, who had visited with you earlier this season. And one of the statements that came from the meeting was, we do not currently have means for guarding against bad and misleading research. They went on to say that this kind of problem is exacerbated very often by national policies. And this group and several other groups have subsequently uh, the Office of Management and Budget, uh, and we mentioned at supper tonight the um, people at uh, the urban policy, people at housing and urban development, and a variety of uh, academics have begun to set up urban impact analysis. And the caution that I find in almost every meeting that I've attended where this discussion has come up is we did not know and we probably would not know now that we have lamentations about it what really would have happened with the Highway Defense Fund? Did we know we were going to spawn suburbs? Did we know that this would be an opportunity for a self-selection process to separate people of different income groups? And most often the question is, well, no, in hindsight is good. But the privilege of hindsight, again, in our dilemma, is not readily apparent. What do we do then when we face dilemmas? We can do what is expedient. And for many of us, we can do what will produce visibility and some bravado. And I remember very vividly hearing a planner say, if we don't know what to do, you do something and you do it with a splash. And if you get enough attention, then people will believe what you're doing. And that's a part of the planning process to have someone put their trust in you. We can do what is best based on our individual careers, and that isn't unusual, is it? We can do what seems right based on the body of knowledge and the skills that are available to us. Or, on a deviation on that, we can do what seems right based on the body of knowledge, the skills, and a philosophy of planning that we've adapted as a part of our own professional lives. When faced with dilemmas, we are also faced with opportunities. And it just occurred to me, because I, I was mentioning um, uh, eminent uh, newscaster and columnist uh, 
who told the story uh, at a recent meeting in Washington about his disdain and his probably, uh, as he was describing it, his fear of the way modern Americans face uh, calamities and dilemmas. And he said uh, to the audience, think back with me if we had a series of events superimposed upon us that we find uh, were evident in classic literature. Suppose in America today, a young man came home from four years at college and he was met at the door by someone who said to him, I'm very sorry, I, I have some really bad news to give to you. Your uncle has murdered your father and he's married your mother. And you remember the lovely woman that you loved so much, Ophelia? Well, disaster has beset her. And he says, now this is a dilemma. And in modern America, the young man would look up and say, let me think a while. And he'd say, got it. I'll go for my masters. <laughs> We can call upon a body of knowledge and we can call upon analytical skills to face dilemmas. And each of these can help us to fashion solutions. Basically, these will help in discovering what has been done in the past and what could be done in the future. But what should be done rests with the interpretation of the set of data. This, there's so many graphic illustrations of how we interpret data. I was doing a national study of elderly housing and I had to caution myself about becoming schizophrenia, schizophrenic. I would address one housing project and of course noting, you probably know, less than 1% of minorities are in uh, elderly nonprofit housing. And I would say, you know, why don't you tell me about how you analyze this problem? And the response from some people would be, black people have very close family ties and so they take care of their own. So you don't find elderly people going into uh, elderly housing. And then I'd move on to another project and people would say to me, Black people have strong rural ties, and so they don't like to live in high-rise buildings, so that's why they don't want to live in our housing projects. And then I'd go on to another housing project, and people would say to me, well, see, this housing project is not accessible to minority families because we had to build housing for the elderly away from family housing because when you live around uh, low-income black people, there's a lot of social disorganization, and we don't want that infringing upon the elderly people who need peace to live out their lives. So I had disorganization in black families, such strong organization, rural tendencies. So the end result, of course, in the interpretation of the data said to me simply, there are no black folks here. But the interpretation of the data helped me to ask some other questions, the why question. A major consideration is that the dilemmas do not simply require our overcoming or lack of knowledge and skill. Even though it's not the world's best example, there was a knowledge base from which people were deciding where elderly black people and other minorities might want to live and why. Knowledge and skill in planning administration can probably cope with and produce answers to show how levels of government can be coordinated. The use of the structure that is born out of the analysis will, however, rest with the planner who becomes the user. And this is not value free. Probably we have the knowledge and the skill to provide a list of options for potential recipients of financial assistance. 
but the planner, not the equation or the computer printout, will decide whether to go along with acceptable elderly housing or needed family housing. The knowledge and the skills are probably available to list the incidents of unemployment and underemployment, but that data may not help to decide ultimately who should get the CETA funds. We probably know how to market the availability of 312 rehabilitation loans, but someone has to decide to whom and to achieve what goals, economic, social, and even a racial mix, should be considered in the decision. Planners do not and probably cannot afford to avoid dilemmas, even as it was suggested the presidents that exist, the president that exists and those that follow will do in any initiative that relates to anything in an urban policy. Nor should we, I contend. These dilemmas should not be avoided, but they should be faced with the reality that not only information and skill come to play in addressing them, but the planner's value construct. When this is made explicit, the dilemmas can be met with planners not only telling what their policy choice is, but why it is chosen. And this, I challenge you, is the missing ingredient in the planning equation. I'm instructed to keep this to try to answer questions. I was intrigued with the impact statement, and I would just like to ask, had we known what the highway system would do to us, would it have made any difference? Uh, most of the impact, uh, I guess, statements and in, in, uh, analysis that I've seen have been determined more with the fiscal impact rather than the social impact. So I just wonder in, in our society if we can make those kind of studies, and if we do, will they be effective? Because I think people want to struggle in this country. I, I think con um, conventional wisdom would lead me to say, yes, you're absolutely right. The decision would have gone on. But that's only because I think the the way in which decisions are made uh, confines the decision making to people who ratify uh, what is expected of them. Uh, you have a, a body of uh, the world's, in quotes, or the nation's best thinkers, and it becomes very incestuous so that I know what Dave thinks and Dave knows what Malcolm thinks, and then the room where the decision would probably be made to look at the alternatives would be a bunch of people such as that who are like thinkers, and so they would sit in and uh, conjure together about it and come up with this notion that maybe it would be bad, but we'll go on with it. Now, in what I'm talking about and what I'd like to see happen with the courageous planners and those who aren't afraid to have their value construct challenged, because what you're talking about is not that I would agree with you, but we would have a forum whereby we could look at the, the alternative futures and we could say these are the possible good and these are possible negative consequences of pursuing any of those. So within a forum, and I guess we could even go back to the kind of uh, the, the planning process that Davidoff talked about in 65, that if you have something good to say, then it should be able to stand up to the test of advocacy. Now, my response to you is no. But if we could open up the planning process and have a variety of analyses 
then I think that we could end up with something that would be uh, more reasonable in terms of, if not overcoming, lessening negative consequences. But that won't happen until the planning uh, choice is open. And also until we say what I was trying to get at, uh, what are your basic assumptions? Why do you want to do this? How do you define the problem? And that doesn't happen. And <laughs> Yes? <laughs> the way it's, it's been about a year since the uh, President's Executive Order creating the Urban Impact Analysis Concept and about a year since the Office of Management and Budget has issued their guidelines for that, the deadline for the first urban impact analysis is in August. I haven't seen that much motion. What real likelihood is there that there will be an enforcement of the urban impact analysis order? I, my prediction is that there will be little. One of the things that I think prohibits uh, there being anything sound it's because people are afraid to admit mistakes because it will be punitive. Can you imagine an agency saying um, to OMB, we were, we were doing uh, X last year and it had negative impacts on uh, the urban environment. And so they say, all right, so we take the money away from this program. You know, it's, it's not structured so that it makes any sense that you, know, you get punished if you admit that you want to move on to do something better. The other thing is uh, simply, not simply, it, it certainly is more complex than that, um, is the, the turf game that's being played out among the various agencies. Um, it, it's no secret, and certainly I wouldn't have a corner on it if it were a secret, so I can say it. Um, when you, you see, even with the... Uh, when the pronouncement came of the urban policy, now the, the locus of it was uh, basically HUD and Secretary Harris, but it was Secretary Krebs who gave out information with telephone numbers at the um, um, press conference saying, call us, that you know we're really doing something. And then OMB steps in and said, but we're going to do the analysis on the impact, so we don't care whether you talk to either one of them. And HUD says, but we're doing our own anyway, so you know you go right ahead with yours. But yet, the dilemma, you know, as I set forth in the beginning, is the, um, the policy proceeds from these groups who have yet to organize themselves into some kind of coherent theme to say, you know, these are things that we can do together. HUD is... Uh, afraid that housing for the poor will go to HEW. You know, and they're saying, you know, give us back our poor. They really belong to us. And all of these things directly impact at the local level. And, and the point I made in the beginning, I think, deserves reiteration, because while all of this is being played out, and uh, I should not even um, engage in, in the, the kind of... Uh, joking about it that I did because it deserves far more uh, importance than that. That in the meantime, local groups are waiting to say, what is going to come down to us? What are we going to have to do? And with what amount of money? And there is not the luxury um, to say nothing or to do nothing. So, Malcolm, my answer is I don't expect anything. If there's anything, it will be comparable to the first thing that was issued, which I couldn't understand, uh, you know, just a list of things and say, uh, put an X if it were very much, minus if it were very little. And, was, and then what I did was um, I took it back to the office and I attempted um, to get my colleagues to, to do it uh, based on um, technical assistance program that we have in small cities. So we don't know what this means. I took it to Lynchburg um, to some students in, uh, that work in planning in uh, that city. And they looked at it, gave it back to me. They wouldn't even engage in it. May I answer any other questions? Police 
is development under the LEA like the yeah I yeah yes um, and of course um, Samuel yet uh, speaks about it. have you read the choice I don't have any data with me but I, I can certainly send you something we also um, at the Joint Center, we had a series of workshops on black crime and crime, and then we also doing some other work with LEAA. But one of the interesting things is not only the riot control uh, that I think you're alluding to, and yeah. I don't know, and the data is, uh, they're spurious because one of the things that um, happened with LEAA, and you probably know they're in a lot of trouble, you know, the leadership is waning and nobody knows who's in charge, but the, the use of LEAA funds for um, higher education as opposed to actually the law enforcement. I can send you some things. I, actually, you could write to somebody named Peggy Triplett at LEAA who is actually working with that. Or I can, if you, you know, give me your name. No figures on how much might be sent down by literally arms and We looked we looked at some and, and I just don't have them with me. But we I don't even know if they're the accurate figures, but uh, some figures uh, that we have out of the black crime study. I got one question that really bothered me because it's even happening here in Muncie on a small scale. And that is the fact that so many tax dollars were spent earlier to build the highways that you express to take people out to the suburbs. Now, a lot of them are finding out they made mistakes. They're coming back. But the families that they're displacing in the inner city are poor families. You know, what, what happens to these poor families? Well, again, that, that's a value choice, and as a black elected official, um, you may even see some of the dilemmas that go beyond what planners face. Okay, if you, not you, but if a person is um, the mayor of a city, and you have what it's described as high cost people and they are in, in uh, predominance in the city and there's the opportunity to have revenue generating people return to the city then you are faced with uh, a concern now with a black elected official it might even be compounded not only in terms of who can pay, but who's going to vote for me. If uh, there's a return and there's a, a mix of people, well, I still have the same power base that I had in the past. So sometimes I'm not sure that some black elected officials are more concerned about their power base as opposed to who's being displaced. But the question, it's, it's not an easy one to answer. And I think many people who write about uh, displacement, gentrification, or the variety of things have uh, really uh, excellent grip on, remember the old book, How to Lie with Statistics? You know, they you know, play it either way. Um, because some people say there's displacement, but there's not gentrification. Other people say that while that there has, choice has been exercised and people have moved to, to better homes. And so, and they could not have invested or afford, um, could have afforded to repair the homes in which they were living where the rehab has taken place. I think you have to call it on a, a local level uh, with very discreet information as opposed to the generalizations. Of course, uh, Secretary Harris said that there's no um, displacement taking place any place. As a matter of fact, she said um, at a session, I refuse to deal with that question. It's a myth. 
Next question. I don't know, but, but certainly the dynamics suggest that there's something going on where, as you suggest, people, some people are being deprived. But again, uh, it raises the question of how are the decisions being made? Is it in a conscious way that some people are being replaced or being forced to move? And if it's not being made in a conscious way, is the end result the same? And therefore, should that be something that is given close scrutiny? But as an elected official, I, I would strongly suggest that you ask uh, local black officials what, what is on their mind and what is it that they seek in wanting to overcome displacement. Um, you know, I was saying to Dave and to Malcolm earlier that there's a degree of, of uh, schizophrenia that even exists in this question. Do you remember not too long ago when people were saying that white flight had left the cities black, brown, and bankrupt? Do you remember that? Or maybe they said in different ways, but the money people have gone from the cities and they've left the cities to rot. And now we're saying, now you're coming back to take it over. You know, uh, is there a tipping point? Is there a balance? Who defines the tipping point? Do we want the um, heterogeneous society? And do you as uh, consciously in the planning decisions when you face the dilemma that was proposed here, say, all right, from my value construct, and I'm going to lay it out there so that everybody else can see it and deal with me and give their own analysis of where I'm coming from, I'd like to see a mixed society. I'd like to see it all up income white, all up income black, or what have you, because of these reasons. And yet I think even, even minorities have not said, for these reasons. What we say is somebody's doing something to us again and we don't like it. And so, you know, almost as, um, with a, an air of uh, paranoia, you begin to respond, and that's not sufficient. Yes, sir. Well, you were saying that you think it's very difficult to get any cohesive urban policy from above, from the center. Do you see any possibility that? neighborhood movement uh, can have enough cloud or enough cohesiveness to bring about something tantamount to a national policy from below from the grassroots? Not now. I think that the, the neighborhood movement is equally as truncated, fragmented at the local level as at the national level. Um, I left the National Neighborhood Commission meeting feeling that I was in 1960. Um, people came from all over the country, and they came in with the rhetoric of the 60s. They, the first thing on the agenda was, we want to have a, a minority report from the neighborhood groups. They said, have you heard the majority report? No, but we know nobody else can represent us. And you know, the whole Bogart mentality it was at the same meeting that um, neighborhood groups asked all the representatives from uh, cabinet offices to leave. Brock Adams can't come, he can't send you flunky out. Pat Harris isn't here, you get out. And I think we have to go beyond the, uh, the kind of uh, street um, planning, warfare, guerrilla, um, tactical movement to strategies and goals. And if neighborhood groups just are reacting, um, then I don't think anything can happen. One of the proposals that um, was presented in terms of neighborhood groups is that they deal with incentives to uh, elected officials to work with them, and the response was, we put them in, we'll put them out. Don't you give them any money, give the money to us. So, you know, the sophistication to deal with the realities of the political world, uh, I think, are necessary. I'm not suggesting uh, to capitulate to it, but to understand 
how you deal in order to, to develop strength. So for something to trickle up um, needs to have a base, a goal, uh, some system for organizing, and an understanding of why they exist beyond a few people who want to play some ego trips. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Maybe. Do you see a future for the urban situation emanating from the grassroots level? And what more might this take this greater autonomy element? Do I see the possibility for a policy? Where does the future lie? And does it have anything to do with a greater autonomy at the grassroots level? I'm not sure I know how to answer that. But my first reaction is that I'm, I'm personally afraid of the whole notion of of who has autonomy. Um, I think that a part of the problem, and, and I, I do agree with you that I, I say it's a complex problem, but I don't believe it's uh, insoluble. I think the problem is that there are too many people looking for autonomy and for an opportunity to be in charge of something as opposed to collaboration and sharing. And as opposed to the bottom up or top down, what I would really like to see, and you know, some people say it sounds utopian, it's terribly unrealistic, and uh, you know, forget about it, is for the, if the president had done a little better than what he did with the urban policy, to start with some notions maybe from the top, but to branch out and to give people an opportunity to gather and to think and to talk and to hold regional meetings and to analyze the problem and to, to get some analysis going as opposed to calling in uh, the traditional people to think. And th therefore, what I, I see is reciprocity. There's some people who have information uh, at one level and it's different, it's not better. And there are people at the grassroots who have another set of information, it's different. It's not necessarily better but it's the mosaic of those the kinds of information that I see that need to be brought together. And I think a graphic illustration of what my own personal philosophy is, is what is happening with people lashing out about is there a new right or is there a conservative uh, mood about in America. Um, there is, is one mood defined and one idea, one analysis presented only to the extent that we do not seize the opportunity that a democratic process permits. So, you know, who goes to hearings? Has anybody testified to say, yes, this is what the president has set forth about inflation, but here's an alternative policy that might be considered. This is what is being said about energy, but this is what I know about uh, how your measure might impact upon the people with whom I work. You know, it, it, uh, it smacks of uh, idealism or whatever, so people say, you know, let's not try it or let's not do it. And then the groups that do advance themselves are looked upon as some wide-eyed, uh, you know, radicals or else uh, they're out of step with what's going on. So my, my quick response to you is that I don't think that autonomy should rest any one place. That there should be an opportunity for a variety of ideas to emerge. But unless we permit, unless we force an, a public agenda, I guess is, is the statement, so that something else um, is discussed. You know, you, you go through uh, hearings, and it's almost scary in some instances because 
you say, I elected these people, and then they're getting a message. And, you know, you, you, you read the thing and you say, but that's not what I believe, and then you put it away. So somebody else tells them. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be with you. I really enjoyed it.